Welcome to G-Captain Live edition. I'm your host, John Conrad. I'm also the founder and CEO of G-Captain. I apologize for the technical problems just one minute ago and for the live uh, mic, if you heard any cursing, I apologize. But I am a sailor in my defense, and I was, I did grow up in the Bronx, so um, I... We, I got a phone call in the middle, and we forgot to put the Do Not Disturb on one of the iPads that does our switching here. Let me see if I can show you some of the studio. We have the uh, iPad Pro currently going on with the switching connection. Oh. And uh, we can do all our remote feeds and stuff with the different things, but uh, if... I forget one of the settings. There's some complicated stuff there. Anyway, thank you for staying with us. I apologize for that. Uh, again, we are mariners here. We're not video experts. So hopefully we get all these bugs worked out in the coming days. And I appreciate you sticking with us. I'm looking at the wrong camera again. All right, I got to reset because things have not been going right this morning. But it's been a, a wonderful uh, weekend uh, here in Morro Bay. We got a lot of rain on Sunday, which meant a nice leisurely uh, day at home. Spent it with the kids uh, playing uh, video games, uh, board games. Machi Koro is our current favorite. Uh, it was one of the uh, G Captain's gift guide for Christmas last year, and the family loves it. And spending some time with the family here in uh, Morro Bay and appreciating the rain because we've had a drought here in California uh, for many years. So all the rain we can get is good. All right, breaking news story. Right before, part of the reason we had these technical difficulties is right before we went on air, uh, there was another earthquake in Fukushima. Let me bring this up. Tsunami imminent after a large earthquake hits off Fukushima, Japan. Breaking news. And here we go with the, here's the map of the uh, strike zone. An earthquake with a preliminary magnitude of 7.3 hit northern Japan on Tuesday, uh, causing the country to issue tsunami advisories for much of the nation's northern Pacific coast. The epicenter of the earthquake, which was felt in Tokyo, was off the coast of Fukushima, at a depth of 10 kilometers or six miles, the agency said, there were no immediate reports of damage or injury, um, which struck at 5.59 a.m. So the Japan is bracing right now as we speak for a possible tsunami in Fukushima. A couple of good things about this is one, this is projected to be a 7.5 earthquake as opposed to the major one uh, a few years ago, which was a nine. The other good news is all of the coastal uh, nuclear power plants have been shut down since the Fukushima disaster a few years ago, and now there are only two nuclear power plants still in full operation. Those are inland. Now for the bad news is the fact that Although these nuclear power plants are not producing energy, as we talked in uh, episode 9, I believe, we talked about nuclear waste. The big problem is the fuel and the waste. Um, these and the cool down period. So when you're decommissioning a nuclear power plant, it often takes years for the power plant to cool down to sufficient levels where things are safe and all of the fuel can be removed for the re reactor. So although the coastal power plants at this time are shut down from producing energy, there is still a nuclear material at these power plants. So we're bracing to find out what happens then. Now, I worked a little bit with uh, Chuck Castro after the Fukushima incident. About a year later, he was the United States uh, Nuclear Agency's representative to Fukushima at the time. And uh, Chuck is a competent and wonderful guy. And about a year afterwards, he put together a report on 
what can we do to make, prevent that from happening in the United States? And uh, so we, we got a lot of information and there was a lot of quick learning about nuclear power back then. And if you haven't seen our nuclear episode of GCAP and Live, go back a couple episodes uh, to find it. All right, I also wanted to call out you guys. A lot of people are wondering how can we be notified of these um, broadcast as we broadcast them well we're putting them on gcaptain.com uh, so if you're subscribed to the gcaptain updates live updates it should come to your phone otherwise if we bring up the uh, facebook page right here you can go in the right, upper right hand corner of what you're watching right now click on here and uh, turn on live notifications so once we click on this, you'll be notified within with your uh, Android or iOS device exactly when we go live. Why is this important? Um, because we're still in the beta phase of this live broadcast. As we move forward, um, hopefully we get on a set schedule. But right now we want to try out different times and um, so we're not going to be in the same time every day and we're not going to broadcast every day in these first couple of weeks as we kind of figure out our schedule and work on equipment and our studio setup here. So again, you can go to uh, up in the right hand corner of the post and turn on your notifications if you're enjoying these videos. Um, so. We live on uh, feedback here at G Captain. It's the how we work. Our news articles are all submitted from you guys. We get uh, live information from mariners around the world. And also, we really appreciate your feedback. Now, I do want to say I've been struggling a little bit with some of the personal feedback. We have a lot of feedback coming through G Captain, hundreds of messages a day, and they're posted to the G Captain forum. I get direct messages from G Cam. I get phone calls. I get text messages. I get email messages. We're also putting this video on YouTube. We get YouTube messages, YouTube comments, Twitter messages, direct Twitter comments to my own personal Twitter, to my own personal Facebook, and to the G Captain Facebook, we get comments and messages. So right now, I want to say, if you have something important, uh, leave it as a comment to this video while we're going live. Uh, even if we stop going live, you can still add a comment to the video afterwards, and I will read that before the next episode and try to answer those qu any questions that you may have. You can also go up to, if we bring up back up the G-Captain Facebook page. All right, uh, right here you can send, oh, I'm on the administrative page. But you can send us a message directly, uh, and that is one way through Facebook, and uh, we check those every day. And again, my email is john at gcaptain.com, so if you have a personal question request, feel free to email me. But uh, we get a lot of emails. So these are just some of the ways, email or sending a message or a comment on the video are probably the best ways right now. All right, I got something really uh, exciting to show you guys. I have it uh, hidden down here below my desk. It's my absolute favorite Christmas gift of all time. It's uh, what, you know, I was given it. Uh, GCAM's offices were given one of these uh, a few years ago, two years ago. And I've since bought a few for my house and a few as gifts to friends and family. And I just love these things. Um, they're called 3D wooden charts. And um, I have one right here I want to show you guys. One second. This is it. This is the actual chart. So a um, friend of mine, Robbie, is uh, the creator of 3D wooden charts. And he did, well, we get a lot of reflections here off the chart. We get a lot of um, uh, people who stop by the office and uh, talk to us. And Robbie is the artist behind the 3D charts. He actually 
learned his art and went to school and met his wife at Cal Poly, which is in San Luis Obispo, a big, uh, highly rated college here uh, near Morro Bay. And so he's a local uh, to California here, to the Morro Bay area. And he created these charts. And the first time I saw one of these, I was just amazed. This arrived in the mail. This is the chart for Santa Barbara, California. Now, a lot of people have approached um, Robbie to do other charts, uh, ski resorts and land-based charts. And he said, no, I want to focus just on maritime charts. And he creates these uh, 3D printing out of wood. So it's uh, laser engraved, and he gets these charts from NOAA. So these are not navigationally approved. Don't bring these on your, on your ship and try to navigate off of them. But they are very accurate for charts. So you have all of the information that you would have on a chart, all laser engraved. He does delete some of the things like the notices that aren't visually appealing. I mean, this is a work of art. And then, as you see, you know, the really cool charts, the best ones, are ones that have kind of uh, varying degrees of depth. So right here is Santa Cruz Island, Santa Rosa Island. We got Santa Barbara and Oxnard right here. Uh, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica. And we're up, we're up in this section. Morro Bay is around Point Conception. And Catalina Island, which is, uh, we take our, our sailboat every summer, and it's a great place to visit with the kids. But as you see, there's depth to these charts. I don't know, it's, it's about uh, th two and a half, three inches thick, this chart. And that thickness adds depth into the contours. So each of the depth contours is another layer of wood. And man, it's hard to see it on the website and it's hard to get an idea for pictures, but these things are just gorgeous. I mean, they're really attractive. They come in different sizes. I have the one for Manhattan at home and it's a long chart that is really uh, good looking. They have the compass rose in there and uh, beautiful artwork uh, by, by Robbie and his wife and they're a little bit expensive. They range between $150 and $300 uh, about, depending on the size and the location that you want to get. But it is really quality craftsmanship. There are some other charts um, through Amazon that I've seen and, and some other places. You, you can get Robbie's chart on Amazon, but there are some other ones where you see the glue kind of sticking out and, and things are warped a little bit. Not the case with these charts. These charts are, you know, you, you could you could put them in a corporate office or uh, in your living room and they're really top notch. And here at G Captain, we love supporting the small guy, the little guy, the artist, which is why I'm giving this call out uh, for these wood charts. Robbie's a small artist, him and his wife, they're, they're producing these growing his personal company to a, to a rather decent size. I mean, this is their living. But uh, these things have really exploded, and it's because the quality of these particular charts, uh, the below-the-boat charts, are, are first-rate, really good uh, gift. And let me bring up uh, his website here. So to find these charts, uh, I ask you guys to make sure that you're getting the exact one, the one that you want, um, and not one of these counterfeits or something else, is come down to G Captain, and in the right hand side, you'll see wood charts, G Captain's favorite holiday gift. All right, and up above, we have a, a chart of Nantucket Island, another one of my favorite places, uh, vacation places, and there's the chart of Manhattan Island, uh, which I have at home. But um, we talk a little bit about these. And then if you click down here via below the boat, uh, you can go directly to their website. There's also an Amazon link that links you to the authentic uh, ones by uh, Robbie and Kara Johnson. Uh, and, and his website is just beautifully laid out. I think I actually have it loaded here. Uh, of all sorts of, so there, there are a, a 
large number of these charts all around, primarily the U.S., but there are some um, around the world too. Uh, so if you if say you had your wedding in uh, Oahu, Hawaii, you can get the chart for there. And uh, some of the the ones that are really the most uh, dynamic are, like I said, the ones with depth. So here's Hilton Head. South Carolina. And if you see this chart, these deep dredged channels, and even the land has some uh, small lakes and uh, s such, it really brings the quality out of these charts. So again, to make sure you're getting the authentic one, um, I hope go to gcaptain.com and make sure we, we don't want you getting a low quality kind of counterfeit one. Uh, that, you, that you're not going to be 100% pleased with. So um, that's great. And that uh, goes directly to uh, Robbie's site. Um, we, we don't get much from that. The Amazon links, though, I want to say something else before I move in. As this holiday season comes on, we don't ask um, our readers for much, but if you see here on the right-hand side of G-Captain is this... Black Friday Deals Week. If you click on that, you'll be taken to Amazon's Black Friday Deals. But G-Captain will receive a 10% uh, back from Amazon for all your purchases. And not just the thing you link to, but anything in your shopping cart if you click on that link first. We're also going to be doing holiday gift guides. So uh, 2015, if you scroll to the bottom of the wood chart uh, one... You can do related articles down here, and we have the last year's gift guide, which are still amazing gifts. Those related articles, by the way, if you go to most sites, those articles are complete BS, to be frank, and they're clickbait and linkbait and trying to get to another site. The related articles um, at the bottom of every G-Captain article link within G-Captain, or they're hand-picked things that we want you to know about, like a certain book. Uh, but there's no commercial stuff down there, and uh, nothing that's going to lead you to uh, you know, weight loss programs and such. So you can be confident in those links right below. But the Amazon things and things that you buy through Amazon, what we do is we buy office supplies. They give us Amazon gift credit and things that help here at G-Captain headquarters. But specifically this year, all the money that's raised via Amazon is going to go directly into getting new cameras and, and uh, better microphones and improving this studio setup in the coming months. So if you could visit Amazon, uh, you know, if you could click through the G Captain link on your way to Amazon, that's a huge help for us. And you guys get Amazon's low prices. Um, but Robbie's link, the below the boat, I link to his website directly because he's a friend. Uh, we, we don't have the same relationship. But Robbie's looking at, hey, maybe if we get so many sales through his site, he's going to kick back a uh, chart to us. And we may have a contest coming up with a free 3D chart. It's just something that I love personally. And, you know, I know everyone's looking at these Black Friday and no one wants to spend their Friday after Thanksgiving at the stores, especially if you just came off the ship. Or if you're on the ship right now and you have to order a gift, I highly suggest those 3D charts. They're wonderful gifts. All right, the next news item. Well, let's check our uh, Facebook, see if we have any uh, comments and things that we want to, uh, any questions. So if you guys have any questions you'd like me to go over, please post them to the comments right now. Chase Allen says, keep it up. All the kinks will get worked out and you'll be doing fine in no time. Thank you, Chase. I appreciate the positive words. Um, you know, there's there's a uh, little bit of, you know, uh, anxiety goes into this. No one likes to get up in front of a large audience. And I've just been blown away by the thousands upon thousands. Some of our... G Captain live videos have reached over 10,000 people, and it's uh, truly incredible. Cumulatively, it's tens of thousands, and the comments, and I've been getting emails and messages, and it's really heartwarming. But um, 
I'm over that anxiety stage, but still there's some technical things that I don't know. And I feel like I'm aboard the first ship, my first ship again as a brand new third mate on the bridge and not really 100% sure what all the equipment is. That's how I feel here with the studio setup, not being a video guy. But I just have to keep reminding myself, hey, uh, we're getting good feedback. We're getting good comments. People are sharing it. They must like it. And also, no matter how bad I mess this up, the ship's not going to crash. So uh, there's going to be no discharge of oil. So unlike my first time on a um, tanker, there's really no excuse here to be all that nervous. But thank you, Chase. We appreciate the uh, comments. And if things are working for you now, uh, I would like just a, a thumbs up quickly on the video. That just lets me know now that, that it's working for you. All right, if you're having a problem with the video, do that guy with the with his mouth wide open if there's any audio or problems or just leave a comment uh, right now and, and hopefully I can read them. Frank says, hang in there, John. New concepts breed success. I agree. You know, you always have to be pushing kind of 10% above your comfort zone. That's been one of my personal mottos throughout the year and something I try to teach my son uh, you know, you don't want to get in a lull. G Captain's always pushing new features, and sometimes we break things. Um, Facebook, one of my good friends, uh, Nick, was the engineer who designed the network in Facebook. And um, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Nick told me, would always tell him, push it to failure, push it to failure. I don't, we try not to go that far with G Captain, but we definitely try to push outside our comfort zone, whether that's reporting on the risky stories or doing something else. Back here, uh, Mike's just checking something for me. Henning says, I personally really like the uh, live episodes. What's the harm in it? Thank you, Francis. I appreciate those good comments. I don't, I don't see any harm myself. And um, uh, name Chin. Okay, we had another uh, minor glitch. So I apologize for that again. But um, some really good comments here. If you have any more comments, please keep them coming. You know, our comments and our questions are pushing this live show. The biggest question I have every day is what do you guys want to know about? You know, we have a broad range of knowledge here at GCAPT and a lot of experts. I can get a lot of your ans questions answered and the topics. Um, but in order to pick those topics, we rely on you guys to give us the information. All right, bringing up, see if there are any additional comments before we go into our next news story, a big coll collision at sea off the coast of Dover. All right, so right to our next news story. Um, let me bring it up here on G Captain. Damaged Saga Sky moved in to port in Dunkirk, France. All right, let me bring this up. The damaged cargo ship, and wow, look at this picture, guys. Um, you know, we, we work really hard at G Captain to try to find the most impactful uh, media photos and videos to accompany our articles. I think a picture tells a thousand words and to get your eyeballs on it is an important part of what we try to do at G Captain. Um, the most visually stunning and impactful and the, we really work a lot on images that give you information. So this is a picture of the Saga Sky, a Saga Welco ship. Saga Welco is a Norwegian company. And the article says the damage cargo ship Saga Sky has been moved into port to undergo repairs after losing power and steering and colliding with a stone barge off 
Dover, England on Sunday. The ship sustained damage and was taken on water after it drifted into a rock barge in heavy weather, approximately three miles southwest of Dover. The UK Coast Guard said it received a distress call around 7.20 a.m. Sunday, reporting it had lost power and steering with 23 people on board. As the incident unfolded, two UK Coast Guard helicopters airlifted 11 non-essential crew and transported them to Dover. Um, and now an update today uh, from the ship's manager said the Saga Sky had left her anchorage off Dungeness early Monday morning on passage to the port of Dunkirk in France, where the vessel would undergo permanent repairs. All right, so that is the uh, Saga Welco ship, Saga Sky. Now, a few things uh, very interesting about this um, particular vessel, the Saga Sky. It was built in 1996 has an overall length of 199 meters or 650 feet, a beam of 30 meters or approximately 99 feet, and a draft of 11 meters, 36 feet. But what's real interesting is this is an open hatch bulk carrier, OHBC. One of the most interesting things at G-Captain that we do is just the sheer number of vessels that we report on can be overwhelming. Uh, we reported a couple of weeks ago about a specialized oil tanker for um, orange juice, carrying orange juice. There are specialized tankers. Some uh, distilleries have ones that carry whiskey and or some other brands bottle it and then put it on containers, these beverages, and some transported in containers that, and then bottled in, here in the United States or overseas. And then there are heavy lift ships and offshore ships and supply ships and tugboats. There are really a large number of interesting ships. Another one we reported on last week was cattle carriers. A cow jumped off of a cattle carrier. So these are huge ships that are basically floating farms that carry uh, cattle and livestock uh, throughout the world. Um, very interesting ships, and this is one of the things that I love most about G-Captain, is learning about these uh, various vessel designs. So I've never worked aboard an open hatch bulk carrier, but I am familiar with the concept. So let me bring up a picture here of not this ship, but another um, open hauled bulk carrier. This one is the Star Star Grip. It's by a different company. So, what is an open hatch bulk carrier? OHBC. Now, if you see this uh, vessel right here, you can notice first of all there are these two large uh, gantry gantry cranes back aft. These cranes are for loading and discharging the cargo from the hatches. Not all OHBCs have gantry crane, but most have some way of self-loading uh, and unloading the cargo. But what all OHBCs have, and if I zoom in here, you see unlike a normal bulk carrier, the hatches actually extend all the way to the sides of the ship. So the beam of the um, vessel we were just talking about, the uh, Segway Sky, the beam is 99 feet or 30 meters. Well, almost that entire length um, is the cargo hatches. Well, what's the point of having the cargo hatches extend to the uh, gunnels and uh, the question is really why not have the cargo hatches extend to the gunnels and the reason why not I mean what the advantage of having that is there is more cargo area available and you can load larger cargoes into that type of bulk carrier now most bulk carriers have smaller hatches and um, the reason is, frankly, the cost. These 
OHBCs are very expensive to construct because they don't have, they need additional steel and support. When we were talking about shipyards in an earlier episode, and I encourage you guys to go back and find the episodes that interest you and, and re-watch them or watch them for the first time. We talked about um, the most critical thing to ship construction, to constructing a strong ship is good quality steel and lots of it. There are no, the computer models can create a new, stronger systems, you know, uh, skeletons inside the ship to add uh, extra strength. But whenever we have a new computer model design, the ship owners and the shipyards often use that stronger computer design in order to reduce the weight of the ship by reducing the amount of steel. So every advance that we've uh, gotten to in terms of computer modeling, modeling computer-aided design has really, the offside of it has been a reduction in the amount of steel and you still need good quality steel and lots of it to make a strong ship. Well, the OHBCs, because they're not getting the intrinsic strength of the top deck, um, require that the actual outside hull is a lot stronger. And this requires a lot more steel and a lot more reinforcements than a traditional bulk carrier. So the OHBCs are more of a specialty ship and they can do a few special things. One uh, interesting thing uh, that they can do is they can carry containers. Almost all of them can carry containers above deck. Some can carry containers below deck. So that gives the ship owner, if there's no bulk car cargo, they can pick up containers and it adds to the versatility of the vessel. Uh, these ships were, first created though in order to uh, handle forestry products. So timber, logs, and also after those timber and logs are uh, turned into paper, all right? Paper comes on these huge reams that are often large and bulky and awkward to stow. That's what the ships were originally designed for is to be able to load the gantry cranes can pick up the log and move it into the cargo hull and you can get these big timbers and these reels of paper into the hold but in addition they found that there are other things you can do with this cargo for instance you we can do containers as you said before you can do a lot of the other bulk cargoes whether it's coal or grain they can also put uh, far extending tween decks so they can do cargo separation within the individual hulls. So these are very versatile ships and there are a lot more of them than you think there would be. Um, in 2006, there were 486 OHBC ships worldwide. So nearly 500 ships. I do not know the current number uh, this year. I, I have not been able to find that. But these are a considerable number of these vessels. Which brings me into my next topic. I want to do a book recommendation. And I hope to recommend this book a few times in future episodes. It's that good. But as I said in episode one, I really think the most important thing for advancing your career all right, we're in very difficult times in shipping right now. We're in very difficult times offshore. I know how you feel. I graduated uh, SUNY Maritime College in 2000 and came in and there were no shipping jobs available for third mates. All of my uh, class, most of my classmates went shoreside. The ones who did go deep, deep sea started as AB. I was the, one of the few to sail right away as third mate. And that was through some special um, techniques and, and things I had come up with, which I'm going to share in a future jobs episode. So stay tuned for that. But one of the keys to my career in starting G-Captain is a diversity of information. 
Early in my career, I jumped on, first I was on Greyhound, Marad, CB vessels, and then I went to product tankers and then crude oil tankers up in Valdez, Alaska. Um, and then I went to offshore and I worked on an old rust bucket, the Discover 534, built in the 70s, and then transferred to the newest drill ships, uh, the latest generation, high, the most technologically advanced ships in the world. And then I did a year in South Korea inside the shipyard. I think that moving around is really good for a career and broadening your knowledge within the industry and our jobs. And the more knowledge you can pack inside, especially from different um, areas, is going to give you job security and help you with those job interviews. It's also, this is a very segmented market. No matter how bad the market is, there's always one section of the shipping industry that is doing well. Usually, as uh, the price of oil declines and offshore really uh, dries up, as we're seeing now, manufacturing is cheaper, transport is cheaper, shipping things is cheaper, and shipping goes up. We haven't seen that now, all right, despite the low interest rates. So we're in a kind of new zone of difficulty right now that I'm very optimistic we are going to move through, and uh, if not, next year, the year after. But really tough times for a lot of you guys. The guys of you who still have your jobs are facing uh, seeing your friends get laid off. You're seeing shipping companies taking already very tight budgets and trying to push you to do more with less. We're in very difficult times. And one way is that diversity. Another way is training. All right, uh, going out and getting the additional training. The more training you have under your belt, the more, more marketable you're going to be. But like I said, this industry is segmented. So offshore is down, shipping's down, but there's one segment of the industry that's up, passenger ferries, uh, passenger vessels, be it ferries or even doing better right now, are the cruise ships. Now, I know what a lot of you think. Hey, I'm not going on a cruise ship because I don't want cargo that complains. You know, those ships do have their own difficulties. I really take my hat off to all the uh, mates and captains aboard the cruise ships and uh, cruise liners out there. But there are things you learn dealing with people, customer service. These are all things that are going to help you with your job. Problem is, it's very difficult to get on a cruise ship if all you have is tanker experience, right? You may have to start a level down. But the thing you need to know first is you need a broad range of knowledge within the industry. And the cheapest, the easiest um, way to do about to go about that is to read. Read lots of books. And don't just stick in your market. Don't just read books about tanker and tanker incidents and the history of tankers. Read ones about cargo and passenger ship, even the ships that you don't like. When I first went offshore, um, I really went with Transocean and on the drill ships. This was before, well before the big boom. This is when there were only 32 drill ships in the world. People were saying, don't, now everyone wants to work for uh, Transocean and Ensco and all these companies, uh, I kind of lucked in a little bit into, you know, these companies are taking the, you know, best graduates of um, the academies. But when I got into it, I got into it from a friend who took an AB job because there was nothing else when we graduated on board this drill ship and got me in after I'd worked tankers as a second mate. People were saying, John, don't go over there. First of all, it's filled with Southerners. These guys are different. They don't like Northerners. Well, that true proved to be false. Some of my best friends uh, I have right now and have had since working are from the South. Uh, they do look at things different, but those are get up and go guys, and they're very knowledgeable in their subsets, you know, what, what they know. Uh, some great guys to work with. So that was another one problem. Another problem was, hey, there were only 34 drill ships, 36 in the world in 2002, about when I got into it. 
there weren't that many ships and they said hey you're going to get pigeonholed in these drill ships and if the oil market goes down like the 70s you're not going to be able to do anything else well that's a risk i was willing to take because i had already been on a few different types of vessels um, moving around, I never saw it as a negative thing. I saw it as a new learning opportunity. But to tell you the truth, I didn't like the drilling aspect of it. All right. I also didn't like the engine room stuff. I never wanted to go into uh, engineering. My dad wanted me to be a facilities engineer. Graduating Fort Schuyler, if you get a facilities, you can go work in a hospital. Hospitals have all the backup emergency systems, steam systems of a ship. Almost a lot of hospitals in the country, because they need the backup power and, um, and so forth, and systems, they need to be self-sufficient. They hire marine engineers. My dad wanted me to do that. I got an engine room, and I wanted nothing to do with it. Well, getting on the drill ship, uh, as I got promoted up to chief mate, I had real difficulties first dealing with the engineers. I didn't understand them. I didn't really like them. They didn't really understand me. Um, well, it didn't. I had a few tumultuous exchanges with chief engineers, let's say. I had some that I worked with that were great. But then a... Uh, I read this book on marine engineering, and I said, wow, these are some of the largest engines in the world. The things these guys do, the interests. And I became very curious about the engine room and started spending a lot of time poking around down there. And yeah, first, whenever you get into something new you don't know about, the engineers gave me a hard time, and they said, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Get back up to the bridge. But after you become friends with these guys and shows be some persistent, now... You know, it only took a few months and and I got the engineers on my side. I was able to help them with their problems. They were able to help me with my problems. And as a decky, I really get the good side of that. As I tell my neighbor, who's a first uh, engineer, he's always coming over and helping me fix things at home. Um, he's a uh, chief engineer with Edison Schwest. You know, I say, hey, Rick, thank you so much for uh, help for fixing my car. Anytime you find yourself lost at, in the middle of the sea and you need some help with the sexton to figure out where you are, give me a call. I'll come right over and, and help you out with that. Um, so there's not too much I can help, um, help Rick out um, at home. But on board ship, there's a lot we can do for engineers. And you can get that, you know. And here's the tip to getting people to like you. You know, engineers and deckies, I've seen a lot of ships where they, they butt heads a lot. And the key is if you want someone to like you, if you want, and not just like help you out, the key is we like people who who help us, all right? Hopefully you, you guys like G Captain. The reason is because we help you. We provide news and information to you for free, quality news. And in exchange, that's how we determine our likes, especially when it comes to people. So this first start is understanding them and reading a book about marine engineering. All right. And then uh, you can read a book about cruise ships. There are countless books out there. And one thing we have done on G Captain is we're starting to do, if you go to any of our news stories, let me bring this up. On our news stories, we are, um, a lot of our news stories, and for the next few weeks as we get in this holiday season and people are looking for books as gifts, if you go down, we have these books to the right and left of the news story called Related Books. So if you see a story that you like, you're, you're interested in marine salvage, bam, there's a salvage, a personal odyssey by Ian Tu. Great book. All of these books I have a, a read and approved and they've been sent to us from different people. But all the books you find there are, are excellent books that are going to help you in your industry. Now, you may never get, you may never find yourself in a marine salvage situation. But if you do, having read that book, even though you're not going to be a salvage master and your ability to do things is limited, having read that book is going to give you a background. More importantly, it's going to have you thinking about these topics as they pertain to your ship. Anytime I read, excuse me, 
Anytime I read a book, I'm thinking back to my ship. How does this lesson pertain? How is this equipment in a marine engineering book different than the ship I'm on now? How is it different from the ships I have been on in the past? So those are all important, and I wouldn't limit myself. I wouldn't try to look too much in. If it shows some modern interest, jump in there and read the book. And now I want to show you one of the first books. If you're looking for a book to read, maybe this isn't a good suggestion for my first book because I think it's thicker. Let's look at the chart. Which is, which is thicker, this book or the... Yeah, they're about the same size here. Maritime Economics by Martin Stopford. What it takes to be to do additional training and to read books and really invest in yourself is it's his financial decision. I know it's expensive. Um, my I was in the very first class right when I qualified for my chief mate sea time. I went to the Coast Guard and I said, hey, I'm ready. I went to look on the Coast Guard website and they had just come out with the new regulations for classes, additional classes for the chief mate master. And those classes weren't even available yet. There wasn't another year. So I had sea time for a year. I could have been sat for my chief mate, but the Coast Guard wouldn't let me because I had to take these classes which weren't available. And then when I took them, it was tens of thousands of dollars um, in training, additional training. Some of that the company paid for, some I paid for myself. But how do you have the confidence to invest that amount of money in yourself? And I think the way is you have to understand some of the broader economics of the industry. You know, we're, as I talk to a lot of mariners and they say, John, you're optimistic about next year, but all I see is my friends out of work and I see these problems with our country and the world economy. Where do you get this information to be so optimistic? And it really comes from an understanding. Now, I, I, I went uh, to Marist College and online. I got my online MBA, Master's in Business Administration. Um, so that's part of it, my economics and financial background, having got a master's degree uh, or, or went to school for one. But that doesn't help me with the maritime stuff. What helped me is this book, Maritime Economics by Martin Stopford. There are a lot of books. This is just one I recommend. And there's a lot of great information in this book. But if we go to the back here and we find, look up, open... Open Hatch Bulk Shipping feet, uh, Fleet 496. So if we go to page 496, we can find all of the information, a whole two pages on exactly what an Open Hatch Bulk Carrier is. All right. If you've seen these episodes and I get a lot, how do you know so much information about these types of vessels? These, you know, these random vessels, I get it from this book. The they, uh, orange juice carriers I talked about and LNG ships and tankers and container ships and a lot of smaller ones. Now, here's the thing with this book. There's a lot of advanced concepts. There are things that are going to be really boring. Give yourself permission to skip. All right. I'm not saying to read every page of this book. Look, it's huge. And I didn't read every page. I've read a majority of it. But start with the things that you're interested in. Read those first and mark them off. And then go back and read the other things. If you have some downtime and you're feeling in a good mood, jump into some of the uh, hardcore economics. But it's critical in order to give yourself the confidence in the shipping market to do that investment of training, to know, hey, do I want to be in this industry for another uh, 20 years? What's the ROI, the return on investment, the amount I'm laying out on training? Um, you really need to know the rest of the shipping industry, you need to know your options. And if you're interested in the ship owners and kind of the high level management, this is what those guys read 
in order to know that. So if you ever have a meeting with the CEO of your ship ever comes on a tour, you know, now you're going to have something to talk to him about. Um, and Martin Stopford is around now. He, he, he writes uh, occasionally and you can find him online. I met him once in London, a, a great guy. And yes, the only complaint about this book is some things can be boring, but I'm giving you permission to skip those boring sections in this book and in other books. The important thing is that you read, not that you read things that are going to put you to sleep. And uh, everyone, at least the American Mariners, should be familiar with this book, American Practical Navigator. Now, what I've done with this book um, that I'm going to do with Maritime Economics is... I've annotated it and labeled it. You can get these, um, you know, file folder things and label the very sections so you can grab it and refer to the tables and things quickly. But what American Practical Navigator is to navigation, this is to the economics of owning and operating ships. I think this book is just as critical as this book for your continued career and if you think this book is boring try reading this book cover to cover i i challenge you if anyone has read that cover to cover no you read it through you read the parts that are going to be tested on that are pertinent to you and you find interesting do the same with martin stopford's marine economics book all right so that's my theory, and if you don't like that book, Salvage, the one I showed uh, of Ian 2, that's more of a thrilling book. Um, you, you have real exciting books like Seized by Mark, uh, Captain Max Harbinger, um, a kind of maritime recovery captain and attorney. There's some great books out there, guys. Find one that interests you. As long as it relates to ship, you're going to be ships or maritime. It could be history history to whatever thing part of the industry interests you and we're going to have those recommendations in the article pick up those books uh, another little tip is the kindles you can go down and most of these books are available on the kindle my book is for instance fire on the horizon again i told you if you join g captain club you can download the book and then you can even cancel club within 14 days and still get to keep the book. Uh, but if you go to the Kindle, Fire on the Horizon, you can download the free Kindle previews, first three chapters free. And let me tell you, as an author myself, having written books, I'll say most books are presented by an author. The author says, hey, I got an idea for a story. I want to... and." They may not have 300 pages worth of information. They only sell the book on the first 50 pages. But no one's going to buy or the book uh, the publishing companies can't charge $26 for a pamphlet. All right. So you tell the author, hey, you got 50 good pages, but we need 250. Go, you know, fill it up. And what a lot of books do, this is, I promise you, Everything in here, I could have read it, wrote in a thousand pages. My editor actually made me cut out a lot. But a lot of other, especially like self-help books and stuff, um, they put all the good stuff in the first few chapters. So if you read a few Kindle previews, um, those are great free options to get a lot of information free and quickly. All right, let's look at the Facebook, uh, see if we can reload this comment section. Uh, Frank says, being optimistic is within your soul. If you believe that you have a good idea, then pursue it. Theoretical expertise is critical to have under your belt. Yes, we are all born with optimism. Uh, the economy, getting laid off from our jobs. I really feel for you guys, especially my brothers and crewmates offshore. A lot of guys are struggling right now. It's hard to find that optimism. But remember, we're all at our hearts optimistic people. And getting the theoretical knowledge from the books and then 
going 10% outside of your comfort zone. Again, I'm not comfortable producing videos, but I jumped ahead and do it. You know, the key, you know, people ask, I'm not qualified to go on this type of ship. Am I going to be a danger? Am I going to hurt myself? You know, these are things that's really the only question you have to ask. You know, do you know enough to be competent in an emergency situation? The rest you can learn on the job. First start with the book knowledge and then go apply for the jobs. But I really promote jumping on different kinds of vessels and really taking this time to be optimistic. Another side effect is no one's going to hire the pessimist. No one's going to hire the someone, the warrior who goes into the job interview. If you're excited about that company, about that company's ships, if you have knowledge of that company's operation, even if you haven't been on those types of ships before, you're going to have a much better chance of, of nailing that interview. And I hope to have another GCAM live episode just on interview topics because I haven't gone to a job interview where I haven't been offered the job. And there are some specific reasons why that I want to share in a future episode. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Frank also says, too many people are concerned about damage to the environment with all oil barges and accidents on the hit. Hudson River. What is your take on that, John? Well, Frank, when uh, first year at the or second year at the Maritime Academy, SUNY Maritime, where your your son uh, graduated, Richard, he uh, we went up to Albany, and as we got up, they built all these docks on the river, and as the ship went up, uh, the wake tore off all of these private docks. And we got up to uh, Albany. I believe we had the governor on board the uh, training ship. When we got up to Albany, there was a whole parking lot filled with state troopers and police who were coming to arrest the ship and saying, hey, we did all this damage. Little did they know the governor was on board our ship. And little did they know also that the Hudson River, um, these docks that were torn off were built illegally. The Hudson River is an economic uh, zone. Why New York City is a city? You know, cities, you wonder why is that large city located there? Well, there are a couple of reasons not to do with shipping. One is the bedrock underneath Manhattan allows for large buildings to be created to be built. But the real reason of Manhattan has grown to be uh, one of this country's largest um, cities is because of the Hudson River. A uh, lot of uh, transport, you know, historically has gone down the Hudson River. Uh, New York Harbor is a large transportation, a large maritime hub. The New York Times just had a uh, on the front page of Sunday's newspaper about the Sandy Hook pilots. My point is People are concerned, yes, but we have a lot of knowledgeable, that's one area, you know, talking to mariners, I, I go back to homecomings and I talk to the pilots and the guys who work in the river. There's a lot of expertise there, Frank, and we can do this safely. We can't just say, hey, this is just a environmental park now, we're gonna close down the Hudson River. There's a lot of history in that river, um, the city's, history, why it's there is because of maritime world and commerce. And there's a lot of opportunity for environmental um, benefits. A lot of people are shocked to find out I'm an environmentalist. I am. And when I've gone to interviews with oil companies, I've told them that. I've said, I'm an environmentalist and I do not want to pollute in the water. But you got to understand shipping is the most efficient form of transportation. We have this huge climate change problem. To ship a container via a barge or ship, all right, is, is practical. I mean, you can put a container on a barge and stand on a dock and push it yourself with one hand. There's a low coefficient of friction. Trains are about 10 times more polluting than ships and barges. And trucks are 10 times more than that. And airplanes are ridiculously inefficient. To transport a container of cargo on an airplane is an immense amount of 
emissions. There's been countless studies on this. So I'd say, you know, yes, we need more commercial shipping on the Hudson. We need to use our world or ways. We need to um, invest in short sea shipping. I could go on and on. Um, we talked a little bit about the failures of Marad um, a few episodes ago. That's something Marads had tried to push and they failed at in Europe. You know, you go go to the port of Hamburg. If tons of container ships and then tons of smaller ships and barges or Rotterdam, if you've ever been there, an amazing port city, containers are brought off of these large ships, put on smaller ships and barges and transported there instead of the rail and the air and the trucks that we use in the United States. Um, so I think it's a it's really a win-win, Frank, and we need to do more of it because there's nothing as efficient as shipping. And as long as you have the expertise and safeguards, and it can be safe if things are done right. All right, last question. Rich Madden says, any chance of making G Captain live episodes downloadable? Very good question. I think um, I'm not sure how to do that right now. G Captain is if you go to YouTube and you just search G Captain, you'll come to our G Captain page. And I haven't gotten every episode because we had technical difficulties on a few, but I've been uploading most of the episodes to G Captain's YouTube page. So I'd say, Rich, go to YouTube, type in G Captain, and um, it'll bring you to G Cam's page. You can subscribe there to our page and uh, leave comments there as well. But uh, I think you're able to download from the YouTube. I'm not sure I'll check it. I will also see if we can enable those live downloads. Um, I'm not sure why you'd want to download them, maybe to bring them to ship, um, but we will look into that. Thank you so much, guys. I, that wraps up another edition of G Captain Live. If you have topics you'd like me to bring up in the future, uh, please do that. Also rem remember to uh, subscribe and turn on the notifications in the upper right hand corner as well as um, go to G Captain and we'd love if you guys could use that Amazon link in the right and um, support our friends this holiday season including Robbie at 3D Charts and that's that's really going to help build uh, this G Captain community and the Amazon link specifically and the books you buy through Amazon and such are going to help me invest in um, this video equipment to help with these technical glitches and get a smoother, better looking, better sounding live episodes coming forward. I'm really excited to, to move on this year and really get working on these episodes. And I hope you guys are excited too. I love the comments and the user interaction. That's what it's about. So send us messages, leave comments, and thank you again for joining us on G Captain Live. I'm John Conrad, founder and CEO of G Captain.